of beach cruising and coastal camping and how it evolved. You want to say? Yeah. Well, you should know that, uh, like a lot of things in life, uh, the book is an accident and it's a result of a bigger accident that happened before he wrote the book. We never intended to have uh, become beach cruisers and coastal campers, uh, but uh, you see why we did, uh, and it was a consequence of a series of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what we're going to do is, is going to describe to you how we came to beach cruising, what the choices we uh, made, what choices we made, how we chose <clears throat> where to go, what boat to use, and then how to go about it, and what happened. Did it work or not? And basically, our beach cruising book is about you can do this with any kind of vessel that you like. There's just something about going to, to sea on a boat, no matter what it is, or even an inner tube. Some people have cruised on inner tubes. So for us, sailing was the way to do it. So we'll go through uh, about six chapters of our lives that evolved from boat to boat and how we started and, and how we evolved to the next boat. And we'll be sort of covering the same uh, subjects in each, each, each uh, boating category. So, that, so that you'll see how we decided to move from one chapter to the next. We were lucky to be incarnated. <laughs> <laughs> So Michael's the engineer, so he's going to run the slides. This may be one of the last real old slide shows out there. <laughs> yeah, Diane. With uh, the beginning is when it, we were thought to ourselves, what should we do? We'll, we'll have an adventure. We'll get a big boat. We'll go to sea and just see what happens. But we didn't have much money, so we went out looking for a boat that would be capable of going to sea that would cross the ocean, but was uh, affordable for us. And Sheldrake happened to be that boat. It was a very old 40-foot wooden boat that leaked profusely. <laughs> and we, we bought the boat and really didn't have any idea of where we were going to go. But when we bought it, the uh, owner told us that he had ordered a mainsail. And it was uh, ready for us in England. So we thought, well, that's a place to go. We'll go to England and we'll pick up the sail. So we, we set out and soon realized that we really needed somebody else to help us because we really didn't have, know what we were doing. Michael had had some sailing experience on Long Island Sound. I had never been on a sailboat in my life. And we were going to cross the Atlantic. We decided to Bermuda and then on to England. So we asked a friend of ours to help us out. We didn't get to Bermuda the first attempt because Hurricane Agnes hit. And we luckily lost our rudder and had just motored back into uh, Norfolk when Hurricane Agnes hit that night. We fixed the rudder, we set out and ran into gales all the way to Bermuda and our crew member announced that he would proceed no further with us. <laughs> so well, he said, well, we feel really bad about that because here we are in Bermuda and we need for you to go somewhere because it's an island 600 miles from anywhere. So he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look at the charts. And he came back the next day and he said, I will sail with you to Puerto Rico. So we said, fine, we'll go to Puerto Rico. We went around um, the harbor there in, in Bermuda and we traded charts from England for uh, Puerto Rico. And we set sail, eight days, great weather, got to uh, Puerto Rico and he immediately abandoned ship. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we proceeded and we continued on around the West Indies, but we were discovering what we did and did not like about deep water cruising. We found that we were often in anchorages with a lot of other people and that we really preferred to be uh, more isolated. So this is, here we are. Can you, can you focus? 
uh, dealing with uh, the storm, the, the gale that we ran into with our crew member that made him decide to uh, move on to land. So here's our boat, Shell Drake, uh, anchored now in Bermuda, uh, which was very, very nice. And uh, like I said, after that, we did have a nice sail on down to Puerto Rico. This gives you an idea of, uh, of how, of our, our course. So we could go down to, got down to Puerto Rico, where our crew member left us, and then we proceeded around the West Indies, Venezuela, Colombia, and then back on up to uh, Haiti, and then on up to the Bahamas, which is north of that. We did learn celestial navigation along the way. <laughs> we bought a book called That's awesome. uh, How to Navigate in 10 Simple Steps. It's <laughs> safe <laughs> <laughs> to get a, uh, a sextant, pencils, uh, the H HO249 tables, and we learned how to navigate on our way to Bermuda. Our boat was not so easy to sail. It had a very long bow sprint, and during the storm, you had to walk out there mm -hmm. and, and do sail. But we did end up in some really beautiful places that were uh, totally uninhabited in the places that we really loved being in, but the boat was forever blowing away. <laughs> and leaky. Excuse us for the technical difficulties from time to time. <laughs> there you go. Okay, and so you can see there's Sheldrake anchored down below. So we found that, you know, we began to see what we really loved about uh, uh, cruising around uh, isolated places. The, uh, the lights were kerosene lights to be lit every night. light coming into uh, isolated islands and shores. We, uh, we still needed a new sail because we never got to England. <laughs> <laughs> so after cruising around the West Indies, we really decided that it really wasn't the life for us, that we really loved the isolated places and but we were forever, our boat would always, like, not, it wouldn't be a good anchorage, clearly, because nobody else was there. So the boat would sometimes drift away before we came back, and we'd have to get in the dinghy and chase it down. <laughs> or we would go adrift at night, and somebody would knock on the hull and say, you're adrift. <laughs> so we were sort of on our way back. Uh, we came up through Haiti. We stopped in the Bahamas. We really loved the Bahamas. But our boat drew six feet, and most of the Bahamas is just a very few feet deep. So... Trying to stay there and trying to maneuver around the islands, uh, a, a very big storm came up. We nearly lost the boat in the middle of the night. We moved it around to the lee side of the island, and during the night, uh, we depended on the current and the wind to blow us offshore. The wind died, the current changed, and it put our boat up on the reef. So when we woke up, the boat was on the reef and pounding, and it was already too late. Uh, save her from keeling over and <coughs> being a wooden boat she broke up pretty, uh. pretty quickly so we stayed until morning and then we got off the boat and we had thrown a lot of stuff over the boat to drift in in shore where we thought we'd pick it up from that hefty bags and they all went the other way so <laughs> When we got to shore, there was nothing. We had we had saved one can of potato soup, I remember. So we we slept, and then in the more during the night, we thought we would try walking to the one settlement. This was an island called Great Inagua, the most southern Bahama island. So we walked all that night, and uh, about two thirds of the next day, just heading due west. And eventually, we saw this truck park, and we waved our hands. And you see, we made our little backpacks from the bush, and what you see on us there is what we say. That was the beginning of our beach cruising. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the gentleman that were uh, running the truck 
ran away from us when they saw us coming out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a chance to ask them why they ran away. And uh, they were white folk from the University of Florida. And they said, well, you know, we, we're here collecting plants and you came out of the bush, we thought you were ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so we, we weren't really sure from here what we were going to do, so we, uh, a, sa a boat, a freighter that was in Great Inagua offered to give us a ride back to the States. It was a salt boat, and it took us back to Georgia. And we got backpacking equipment, we went hiking uh, in the uh, New York State, what's the, not Adirondacks, the Adirondacks, yeah. that's right. So we got to thinking about it, we thought, well, you know, we really loved where we read. It was so beautiful. <laughs> what we want to do is we want to go back there but we don't want to have a big boat anymore that we can run aground all the time. So we'll use a small boat, so we'll go ahead. So we, we, <laughs> we did some research and we went to the New York Public Library and we read about this man named Fred Fair, who's in a book called Sailing the Yakaboo. And Fred had taken a cruise down the West Indies in the sailing canoe we thought, well, now, now that would be the thing. We can have a sailing canoe. Our one rule was that we had to be able to take the boat out of the water every night. So sailing canoe, perfect. But uh, we really didn't have much money. So we wrote to the Old Town Canoe Company and asked them if they might, in the generosity of their hearts, donate a canoe for this adventure. And much to our surprise, the president of the company called and said, well, sure. <laughs> so the next thing we knew, we have a canoe, we've got a sail rig, we've got the whole thing, the cover, we've got everything. We thought we're good to go. We fill the canoe up and realize there is no room for us. <laughs> so then we go back to the drawing board and we're all near the water, near the gulf, and we see a Hobie cat sail by and we go, Hobie cat. That's the thing. So we got a Hobie cat and we loaded the canoe uh, with all of our camping gear, food supplies, whatever we thought we might need, and took these, towed these things down to Florida, the south coast of Florida, put them in the water, and sailed across to a national park called Elliott Key, where you can camp for a pretty long time, and there's a place to pull your boat up. We had no idea how this was going to work, so the first time we set out, the Hobie Cat, of course, would try to pull the canoe loaded with everything. The, the front pontoons would go down to the water and we'd flip. So we did this several times on the way out to Elliott Key. And that made us realize we really worked in it. Our idea was to be able to get back to the Bahamas where we had wrecked. That was, that was our goal. But we thought, you know, this doesn't seem good for crossing the Gulf Stream. So we thought that over a while, and then we asked several cruise ships if they might give us a ride over there. And much to our surprise, one of them said, sure. <laughs> so we sailed these two boats up uh, Biscayne Bay, sailed it up to the huge ship docks where the cruise ship was, wrapped on the hull and said, we are here. <laughs> and the crew was so wonderfully delightful. They lowered slings immediately. And we put the boats on the slings and they raised them up. And the captain was standing over there going, no, absolutely not. I'm not taking these people to the Bahamas. But the crew said, oh, yes, yeah. come on, yeah. come on. <laughs> so go ahead, Michael. Yeah. So they loaded it up and they, they put it below. And so I just I can't describe to you what it was like. It was pouring rain. We had been sailing through thick fog up Biscayne Bay under several bridges with traffic over them trying to get here. So now we're on the ship. And here we are. So we're not, we're not planning to go down to the West Indies, but now from Florida you see all of this chain of islands here is the Bahamas. And the one where we wrecked was here, Great Inagua. So it's not necessarily that we're going to get to Great Inagua, but we knew that there were a lot of islands, and a lot of them with no people and very shallow. 
And this just is a give you a good idea of what they're like. They're usually strung out like that, uh, 20 ions in a row. So you can see for a shallow draft boat, it's just and, and uninhabited, so any of those beaches were, we could choose from. So we set out, sailing the Hobie Cat and uh, towing our canoe once we got, they dropped us off in Nassau, and we set out and uh, started working our way down the islands. There's a reason why most of the islands are not in that. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it was ideal. But th this is one of the most, um, can you focus it just a little bit? Yeah. Is, uh, we were lucky because this is the 70s, and a lot of the islands really weren't inhabited, and just absolutely gorgeous. Now many of the ones where we camp for weeks at a time are owned by people like the Aga Khan with you know, the big houses and stuff, but back then it was just birds and us. And we, would, we were able to carry enough water in the canoe to keep us going for two or three weeks <coughs> like this, because we would frequently also find grasses where we could dig a hole, get some water, and use that for, for bathing. We uh, would sometimes just take the Hobie Cat out, and we also, the sailing canoe if we needed